Welcome as Zenith Players returns to online readings with Life is a Dream by Pedro Calderon de la Barca. I am TJ. I am our technical director. All of the actors you'll be hearing tonight are volunteering their time and their talents from their homes to bring a little bit of entertainment into your homes. We want to thank them all very much for joining us. We'd also like to thank our friend, your friendly neighborhood Shakespeare, for hosting this on his pages. You can check out his website at shakespeareapproves.com um, and his Patreon at patreon.com slash Shakespeare. Find out more about him at the aforementioned website or by visiting his Facebook page, Shakespeare Approves, your friendly neighborhood Shakespeare. Uh, we'll have links to visit him as well as uh, some of our other performer friends in the comments of this video if I get the chance. As always, we want to acknowledge and thank all the medical professionals and essential workers who have been working to keep us all as healthy and safe as possible. If you're interested in more information about our Totally Volunteer organization, check out our website, zenithplayers.com. Uh, feel very free to check out our very attractive donations page. 100% of all donations go towards production costs, which these days consist of various subscriptions that allow for these readings to happen, as well as our recent uh, live in-person production of Bernhard Hemp. If you'd like to read with us in future uh, online readings, just send us an email, casting at zenithplayers.com. We will get you right on board. We'll be back soon with more online readings, but for now, relax and enjoy Paula K. Long as Basilius, the king of Poland, Shakira Searle as Sigismund, his son, Aileen Goldberg as Estrella, his niece, Andrew Gelos as Astolfo, his nephew, the Duke of Muscovy, Jacqueline Hume as Rosaura, a Muscovite noblewoman and Astolfo's former lover, Caitlin Jurowitz as Clarine, her servant, Steve Anderson as Clotaldo, Sigismund's jailer, Titania Lovett Spence as the first servant, Andrea DeRiso as the second servant, Mira Singer as the first soldier, and Andrea Atwood as the second soldier in Life is a Dream. Act one. At one side, a craggy mountain, at the other, a tower, the lower part of which serves as the prison of Sigismund. The door facing the spectators is half open. The action commences at nightfall as Rosaura in man's attire appears on the rocky heights and descends to the plain. She is followed by Clarine. Wild hippogriff, swift speeding, thou that dost run the winged winds exceeding, bolt which no flash illumes, fish without scales, bird without shifting plumes, and brute a while bereft of natural instinct. Why to this wild cleft, this labyrinth of naked rocks, dost sweep unrained, uncurbed, to plunge thee down the steep? Stay in this mountain world, and let the beasts their fate and behold, for I, Without a guide, save what the laws of destiny decide, benighted, desperate, blind, take any path whatever that doth win down this rough mountain to its base, whose wrinkled bro in heaven frowns in the sun's bright face. Ah, Poland, an ill mood, hast thou received a stranger? since in blood the name thou writest on thy sands of her who hardly here fares, hardly at thy hands. My fate may well say so. But where shall one poor wretch find pity in her woe? Say too, if you please. Don't leave me out when making plaints like these. For if we are the two who left our native country with the view of seeking strange adventures, if we be the two who madly and in misery have got so far as this, and if we still are the same two who tumbled down this hill, does it not plainly to a wrong amount to put me in the pain and not in the account? I do not wish to impart, Clarion, to thee the sorrows of my heart. Mourning for thee would spoil the consolation of making for thyself thy lamentation, for there is such a pleasure in complaining that a philosopher I've heard, maintaining, one ought to seek a sorrow and be vain of it, in order to be privileged to complain of it. That same philosopher was an old drunken fool, unless I err. Hmm. Oh, that I could a thousand thumps present him, in order for complaining to content him. But what, my lady, say are we to do on foot alone, our way lost in the shades of night? For see, the sun descends on another sphere to light. So strange a misadventure who has seen? But if my sight deceives me not, 
between these rugged rocks, half lit by the moon's ray in the declining day, it seems, or is it fancy, that I see a human dwelling? So it seems to me, unless my wish for the longed-for lodging marks. A rustic little palace, mid the rocks, uplifts its lowly roof, scars seen by the far sun that shines aloof. Of such a rude device is the whole structure of this edifice, that lying at the feet of these gigantic crags that rise to greet the sun's first beams of gold, it seems a rock that down the mountain rolled. Let us approach more near, for long enough we've looked at it from here. Then better we shall see if those who dwell therein will generously a welcome give us. See an open door. Funeral mouth Torbess the name it bore, from which, as from a womb, the night is born, engendered in its gloom. Heavens, what is this I hear? Half ice, half fire, I stand transfixed with fear. A sound of chains, is it not? Some galley slave his sentence here hath got, my fear may well suggest it, so may be. Alas! Ah, wretched me! Ah, wretched me! Oh, what a mournful wail! Again my pains, again my fears prevail! Again with fear I die! Claren! My lady! Let us turn and fly the risks of this enchanted tower! For one, I scarce have strength to stand, much less to run! Is not that glimmer there afar, that dying exhalation, that pale star? A tiny taper which with trembling blaze, flickering twixt struggling flames and dying rays with ineffectual spark, makes the dark dwelling place appear more dark? Yes, for its distant light, reflected dimly, brings before my sight a dungeon's awful gloom. Say, rather, of a living corse, a living tomb. And to increase my terror and surprise, dressed in the skins of beasts, a man there lies, a piteous sight, chained, and his sole companion, this poor light. Since then we cannot fly, let us attentive to his words draw nigh, whatever they may be. Doors of the tower open wide, and Sigismund is discovered in chains and clad in the skins of beasts. The light in the tower increases. Alas. Ah, oh, wretched me, ah, oh, wretched me. Heaven, here lying all forlorn, I desire from thee to know. Since thou thus dost treat me so, why have I provoked thy scorn by the crime of being born? Though for being born I feel, heaven with me must harshly deal, since man's greatest crime on earth is a fatal fact of birth. Sin supreme without appeal. This alone I ponder o'er, my strange mystery to pierce through, leaving wholly out of view germs my hapless birthday bore. How have I offended more that the more you punish me? Must not other creatures be born? If born, what privilege can they over me allege of which I should not be free? Birds are born, that bird that sings, richly robed by nature's dark, scarcely floats, a feathered flower, or a bunch of blooms with wings, when to heaven's high halls it springs, cuts the air, blue air fast and free, and no longer bound will be by the nest's secure control. And with so much more of soul, must I have less liberty? Beasts are born, the beast whose skin dappled o'er with beauteous spots as when the great pencil dots heaven with stars, doth scarce begin from its impulses within. Nature's stern necessity to be schooled in cruelty. Monster, raging ruthless war. And with instincts better far must I have less liberty. Fish are born. The spawn that breeds where the oozy seaweeds float, scarce perceives itself a boot scaled and plated for its needs, when from wave to wave it speeds, measuring all the mighty sea, testing its profundity to its depth so dark and chill. 
and with so much freer will must I have less liberty. Streams are born, a coiled up snake when its path the streamlet finds. Scarce a silver serpent winds among the flowers it must forsake. But a song of praise doth wake, mournful though its music be, to the plain that courteously opes a path through which it flies. And with life that never dies, must I have less liberty. When I think of this, I start Aetna-like in wild unrest. I would pluck from out my breast, bit by bit, my burning heart. For what law can so depart from all right as to deny one lone man that liberty? That sweet gift which God bestows on the crystal stream that flows, birds and fish that float or fly. Fear and deeper sympathy do I feel at every word. Who my sad lament has heard? What? Clotaldo? Say, tis he. No, tis but a wretch on me. Who in these dark caves and cold hears the tale your lips unfold? Then you'll die for listening so, that you may not know I know that you know the tale I told. Jesus, sir. Yes, you'll die for loitering near. In these strong arms, gaunt and grim, I will tear you limb from limb. I am deaf and couldn't hear, no. If human heart you bear, tis enough that I prostrate me at thy feet to liberate me. Strange thy voice can so unbend me. Strange thy sight can so suspend me. And respect so penetrate me. Who art thou? For though I see little from this lonely room, this my cradle and my tomb being all the world to me. And if birthday it could be, since my birthday I have known, but this desert wild and lone, where throughout my life's sad course I have lived a breathing corpse, I have moved a skeleton. And though I address or see never but one man alone, who my sorrows all have known, and through whom have come to me notions of earth, sky and sea, and the harrow though harrowing thee again, since thou'lt call me in this den monster fit for bestial feasts. I'm a man among wild beasts, and a wild beast amongst men, but the round me hath been wrought all this woe from beasts I've learnt, polity, the same discerned, heeding what the birds had taught and have measured in my thought the fair orbits of the spheres. You alone, midst doubts and fears, wake my wonder and surprise, give amazement to my eyes, admiration to my ears. Every time your face I see, you produce a new amaze. After the most steadfast gaze, I again would gaze a bee. I believe some hydropsy must affect my sight. I think death must hover on the brink of those wells of light to your eyes. For I look with fresh surprise, and though death result, I drink. Let me see and die. Forgive me, for I do not know in faith if to see you gives me death, what to see you not would give me. Something worse than death would grieve me. Anger, rage, corroding care, death, but double death it were, death with tenfold terrors rife, since what gives the wretched life gives the happy death despair. Thee to see wake such dismay, thee to hear I so admire that I am powerless to inquire, that I know not what to say. Only this that I today, guided by a wiser will, have here come to cure my ill. Here consoled my grief to see, if a wretch consoled can be, seeing one more wretched still, of a sage who roamed dejected, poor and wretched it is said, that one day, his wants being fed by the herbs which he collected, is there one he thus reflected? 
poor than I am today? Turning round him to survey, he his answer got detecting, a still poor sage collecting, even the leaves he threw away. Thus, complaining to excess mourning fate, my life I led, and when thoughtlessly I said to myself, does earth possess one more steeped in wretchedness? I in thee the answer find. Since revolving in my mind, I perceive that all my pains to become thy joyful gains. Thou hast gathered and entwined, and if haply some slight solace by these pains may be imparted, hear attentively the story of my life, supreme disasters. I am... Orders of this tower! who are sleeping or faint-hearted, give an entrance to two persons who herein have burst a passage. New confusion now I suffer. This Clotaldum, who here guards me, are oh, not yet my miseries ended. Hasten hither, quick, be active. And before they can defend them, kill them on the spot or capture. Treason! 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 treason. Watch guards of this tower who politely let us pass here. Since you have the choice of killing or of capturing, choose the latter. Keep your faces all well covered, for it is a vital matter that we should be known by no one. Well, I question these two stragglers. Are there masqueraders here? Ye, who in your ignorant rashness have passed through the bounds and limits of this interdicted valley against the edict of the king. Who has publicly commanded none should dare descry the wonder that among these rocks is guarded. Yield at once your arms and lives, or this pistol, this cold aspic formed of steel, the penetrating poison of two balls will scatter, the report and fire of which will the air a sound and startle. Ere you wound them, ere you hurt them, will my life, O oh tyrant master, be the miserable victim of these wretched chains that clasp me. Since in them I vow to God I will tear myself to fragments with my hands and with my teeth in these rocks here, in these caverns, ere I yield to their misfortunes or lament their sad disaster. If you know that your misfortunes, Sigismund, are unexampled, since before being born you died by heaven's mystical enactment, if you know these fetters are of your furies oft so rampant, but the bridle that detains them, but the circle that contracts them, why these idle boasts? The door of this narrow prison fasten, leave him there secured. Ah, heavens, it is wise of you to snatch me thus from freedom since my rage against you had become titanic, since to break the glass and crystal gold gates of the sun, my anger on the firm fixed rock's foundations would have marbles, mountains piled of marble. Tis that you should not so pile them that perhaps these ills have happened. Some of the soldiers lead, lead Sigismund into his prison, the doors of which are closed upon him. Since I now have seen how pride can offend thee, I were hardened, sure in folly, not here humbly, at thy feet, for life, to ask thee. Then to me extend thy pity, since it were a special harshness if humility and pride both alike were disregarded. If humility and pride, those two figures who have acted many and many a thousand times in the auto sacramentalis, do not move you. I, who am neither proud nor humble, but a sandwich partly mixed of both, entreat you to extend to us your pardon. Ho! Oh. My lord, my lord. Disarm the two, and their eyes securely bandage, so that they may not be able to see whither they are carried. This is, sir, my sword to thee. Only would I wish to hand it, since in fine of all the others thou art chief, and I could hardly yield it unto one less noble. Mine I'll give the greatest rascal of your troop. troop. So take it, you. And if I must die, to thank thee for thy pity, I would leave thee this as pledge, which has its value from the owner who once wore it, that thou guard it well, 
I charge thee, for although I do not know what strange secret it may carry, this I know that some great mystery lies within this golden scabbard, since relying but on it, I to Poland here have travelled to revenge a wrong. Just heavens, what is this? Still braver, darker grow my doubts or my confusion, my anxieties and my anguish. Speak, who gave you this? A woman. And her name. To that my answer must be silence. But from what do you now infer, oh, fancy, that this sword involves a secret? She who gave it said, Depart hence into Poland, and by study, stratagem, and skill, so manage that this sword may be inspected by the nobles and the magnates of that land. For you, I know, will by one of them be guarded. But his name, lest he was dead, was not then to me imparted. Bless me, heavens! What's this I hear? For so strangely has this happened, but I cannot yet determine if it is real or imagined. This is the same sword that I left with beauty as Violante. It was a pledge unto its wearer, who might seek me out thereafter, as a son that I would love him and protect him as a father. What is to be done, oh me? in confusion so entangled. If he who for safety bore it, bears it now, but to dispatch him, since condemned to death, he cometh to my feet. Strange marvel, what a lamentable fortune, how unstable, how unhappy. This must be my son. The tokens all declare it, superadded to the flutter of my heart. See him loudly rappeth at the breast, and not being able with its throbs to burst its chamber, does as one in prison, who, hearing tumult in the alley, strives to look from out the window. Thus, not knowing what here passes save the noise, the heart uprusheth to the eyes the cause to examine, the, the windows of the heart, through which in tears it glances. What is to be done, oh heavens, what is to be done? To drag him now before the king were death, but to hide him from my master, that I cannot do according to my duty as a vessel. My loyalty and self-love upon either side attack me. Each would win. Oh, but wherefore doubt? Is not loyalty a grander, nobler thing than life, than honor? Let loyalty live, no matter that he die. Besides, he told me, if I well recall his language, that he came to revenge a wrong. A wronged man is a lazar. No, he cannot be my son, not the son of noble fathers. But if some great chance which no one can be free of should have happened, since the delicate sense of honor is a thing so fine, so fragile, that the slightest touch may break, or the faintest breath may tarnish. What could he do more? Do more, he whose cheek the blue blood mantles? But at many risks to have come here, it again to reestablish. Yes, he is my son, my blood, since he shows himself so manly. Then betwixt two doubts of mid course alone is granted to, to seek the king and tell him who he is, but what will happen. A desire to save my honor may appease my royal master. Should he spare his life, I then will assist him in demanding his revenge. But if the king should, persisting in his anger, give him death, then he will die without knowing I'm his father. Come then, come then with me, strangers. Do not fear in your disasters that you will not have companions in misfortune. For so balanced are the gains of life or death that I know not which are larger. They all exit, and the scene shifts to a hall in the royal palace. One side, Astolfo and soldiers. The other side, the Infanta Estrella and her ladies. 
struck at once with admiration at the starry eyes outshining. Mingle many a salutation, drums and trumpet notes combining. Fonts and birds in alternation, wandering here to see thee pass. Music in grand chorus gathers, all her notes from grove and grass. Here the trumpets form the feathers, there are birds that breathe in brass. All salute thee, fair Sonora, ordinance as their queen proclaim thee. Beauteous birds as their aurora, as their palace trumpets name thee. And the sweet flowers as their flora, for aurora sure thou art. Bright as day that conquers night, thine is Flora's peaceful part. Thou art Pallas in thy might, and as queen thou rulest my heart. If the human voice obeying should with human action pair, then you have said ill in saying all these flattering words and fair, since in truth they are gainsaying this par parade of victory against which I may sta standard rear, since they say, it seems to me not the flatteries that I hear, but the rigors that I see. Think too what a base invention from a wild beast's treachery sprung, fraudful mother of dissension, is to flatter with the tongue and to kill with the intention. Ill-informed you must have been, fair Estrella, thus to throw. Doubt on my respectful mien, let your ear attentive lean, while the cause I strive to show. A king Eustigorius the fair, third so-called, died leaving two daughters, and Basilius heir of his sisters, I and you are the children. I forbear to recall a single scene, save what's needful, Coraline, uh, your good mother and my aunt, uh, who is now inhabitant of a sphere of sunnier sheen, was the elder of whom you are daughter, Resicunda, uh, whom God guard a thousand years, her fair sister, Rosamunda, were she called, if names were true, wed in Muscovy, of whom I was born. It is needful now the commencement to resume. A King Basilius, who doth bow neath the weight of years the doom, age imposes more inclined to the studies of the mind than to women, wifeless, lone, without sons to fill his Throne, I and you are way to find you, the elder child's avid, that the crown you stood more nigh. I maintained that you erred, held, though born of younger I, being a man should be preferred. Thus our mutual pretension to our uncle we related, who replied that he would mention here, and on this day he stated, what might settle the dissension with this end from Muscovy I set out, and with that view I today fair Poland see, and not making war on you. Wait till war you make on me. Would to love that God so wise that the crowd may be sure, astrologue to read the skies and this festive truce secure, both to you and me the prize, making you a queen, but queen by my will, our uncle leaving you the throne, we'll share between, and my love a realm receiving, dearer than a king's demands. Well, I must be generous too, for a gallantry so fine, this imperial realm you view, if I wish it to be mine, tis to give it unto you, though if I the truth confessed, I must fear your love may fail. Flattering words are words at best, for perhaps a truer tale tells that portrait on your breast. On that point, complete content, mm -hmm. I will give your mind not here for each sounding instrument tells us that the king is near with his court and parliament. Learned Euclid. Uh, Thales wise. The vast zodiac. 
the star spaces. Who dost soar to. Who, who dost rise. The sun's orbit. The star's places. To describe. To map the skies. Let me humbly interlacing. Let me lovingly embracing. Be the tendril of thy tree. Bend respectfully my knee. Children, that dear word displacing colder names, my arms here bless. And be sure, since you assented to my plan, my love's excess will leave neither discontented or give either more or less. And though I, from being old, slowly may the facts unfold, here in silence my narration, keep reserved your admiration till the wondrous tale is told. You already know, I pray you, be attentive, dearest children. Great illustrious court of Poland, faithful vassals, friends and kinsmen, you already know my studies have throughout the whole world given me the high title of the learned, since against time and time's oblivion, the rich pencils of Timanthes, the bright marbles of Lysippus, universally proclaim me through earth's bounds the great Basilius. You already know the sciences that I feel my mind most given to are the subtle mathematics by whose means my clear provision takes from rumor to its slow office, takes from time its jurisdiction of each day new facts disclosing since in algebraic symbols when the fate of future ages on my tablet I see written, I anticipate time in telling what my science hath predicted. All those circles of pure snow, all those canopies of crystal which the sun with rays illumine, illumines, which the moon cuts in its circles, all those orbs of twinkling diamond, all those crystal globes that glisten, all that azure field of stars where the zodiac signs are pictured are the study of my life are the books where heaven has written upon diamond dotted paper, upon leaves by sapphires tinted, with light luminous lines of gold in clear characters, distinctly all the events of human life, whether adverse or benignant. These so rapidly I read that I follow with the quickness of my thoughts, the swiftest movements of their orbits and their circles. Would to heaven that air my mind in these mystic books addicted was the comment of their margins and of all their leaves the index. Would to heaven, I say, my life had been offered the first victim of its anger, that my death stroke had in this way been given me, since the unhappy find even merit is the fatal knife that kills them, and his own self-murderer is the man whom knowledge injures. I may say so, but my story will say with more distinctness. And to win your admiration once again, I pray you, listen. Chloraline, my wife, a son bore me, so by fate afflicted that on his unhappy birthday, all heaven's prodigies assisted, nay, ere yet to life, sweet life, gave him forth her womb that living sepulchre, for death and life have like ending and beginning. Many a time his mother saw in her dreams delirious dimness from her side, a monster break, fashioned like a man, but sprinkled with her blood, who gave her death by that human viper bitten round. His birthday came at last, all its auguries fulfilling, for the presages of evil seldom fail or even linger, came with such a horoscope that the sun rushed blood red, tinted into a terrific combat with the dark moon that resisted Earth, its mighty lists outspread as with le lessening lights diminish, strove the twin lamps of the sky. Twas all of the sun's eclipses. The most dreadful that it suffered since the hour its bloody visage wept the awful death of Christ. For overwhelmed in glowing cinders, the great orb appeared to suffer nature's final paroxysm of gloom. The glowing noontide darkened, earthquake shook the mightiest building stones, the angry clouds rained down, and with blood ran red the rivers. In this frenzy of the sun, in its madness and delirium, Sigismund was born, thus early giving proofs of his condition. Since his birth, his mother slew, just as if these words had killed her. I am a man. Since good with evil, I repay here from the beginning. 
I, applying my studies, saw in them as twere forewritten this, that Sigismund would be the most cruel of all princes, of all men the most audacious, of all monarchs the most wicked, that his kingdom through his means would be broken and partitioned, the academy of devices and the high school of sedition, and that he himself, born onward by his crimes, wild course, resistless, would even place his feet on me. For I saw myself down stricken, lying on the ground before him to say this. What shame it gives me. While his feet on my white hairs as a carpet were imprinted, who discredits threatened ill, especially a, an ill provision by one study when self-love makes it his peculiar business. Thus then, crediting the fates with which far off my science witnessed all these fatal auguries seen though dimly in the distance, I resolved to chain the monster that unhappily life was given to, to find out if yet the stars owned the wise man's weird dominion. It was publicly proclaimed that the sad ill-omened infant was stillborn. I then a tower caused by forethought to be builded mid the rocks of these wild mountains where the sunlight scarce can gild it, its glad entrance being barred by these rude shafts of silical. All the laws of which you know, all the edicts that pro prohibit anyone on pain of death that secluded part to visit of the mountain were occasioned by this cause so long well hidden there still lives prince sigismund miserable poor in prison him alone clotaldo sees only tends to and speaks with him he the sciences has taught him he the catholic religion has imparted to him being of his miseries the sole witness here there are three things the first i rate highest since my wishes are, O oh, Poland, there to save from the oppression, the, the affliction of a tyrant king. Because of his country and his kingdom, he were no ben benignant father. Who to such a risk could give it? Secondly, the thought occurs that to take from mine own issue the plain right that every law human and divine hath given him is not Christian charity. By no law am I bidden to prevent another proving, say, a tyrant or a villain, to be one myself, supposing even my son should be so guilty that he should not crimes commit, I myself should first commit them. Then the third and last point is that perhaps I erred in giving too, giving too implicit a belief to the facts foreseen so dimly, for although his inclination might well find its precipices, he might possibly escape them. From the fate most fastidious, the impulse most powerful, even the planets most malicious only make free will incline, but can force not human wishes. And thus, twixt these different causes, vacillating and unfixed, I, a remedy have thought of, which with new wonder will fill you. I tomorrow morning purpose without letting it be hinted, that he is my son, and therefore your true king at once to fix him as King Sigismund. For the name still he bears, the first was given him, neath my canopy, on my throne, and in fine in my position there to govern and command you, where in dutiful submission you will swear him allegiance. My resources thus are triple, as the causes of disquiet were which I revealed this instant. The first is that he being prudent, careful, cautious, and benignant, falsifying the wild actions that of him have been predicted, you'll enjoy your natural prince. <laughs> he who hath so long been living holding court amidst these mountains with the wild beasts for his circle. Then my next resource is this. If he, daring, wild and wicked, proudly runs with loosened rein o'er the proud plain of the vicious, I will have fulfilled the duty of my natural love and pity. Then his righteous disposition will but prove my royal firmness, chastisement and not revenge, leading him once more to the prison. My third course is this. The prince, 
being what my words have pictured from the love I owe you, vassals, I will give you other princes worthier of the crown and scepters, namely my two sisters' children, who their separate pretensions having happily commingled by the holy bonds of marriage will then fulfill their fit position. This is what a king commands you. This is what a father bids you. This is what a sage entreats you. This is what an old man wishes. As, and as Seneca the Spaniard says, a king for all his riches is but slave of his republic. This is what a slave petitions. If on me devolves the answer as being in this weighty business, the most interested party, I of all express the opinion, let Prince Sigismund appear. He's thy son, that's all sufficient. Give us our natural prince. We proclaim him king this instant. Vassals, from my heart, I thank thee. I thank you. For this deference to my wishes, go. Conduct to their apartments the two columns of my kingdom. On, on tomorrow you shall see him. Live. Long, long, long live. Long live. Great, Great king, king Vassilius. Vassilius. May I speak to you, sire? Lotaldo, you are always welcome with me. Although coming to your feet shows how freely I'm admitted, still, your majesty, this is once fate as mournful as malicious takes from privilege its due right and from custom its permission. What has happened? A misfortune, sire, which has my heart afflicted at the moment when all joy should have overflown and filled it. Pray proceed. This handsome youth here, inadvertently or driven by his daring, pierced the tower and the prince discovered in it. I may. Lothaldo, be not troubled at, at this act, which, if committed at another time, had grieved me. But the secret so long hidden, having myself told, his knowledge of that fact matters little. See me presently, for I must much speak upon this business. And for me, you much must do, for a part will be committed to you in the strangest drama that perhaps the world e'er witnessed. As for these, that you may know that I mean not your remissness to chastise, I grant their pardon. Years to my Lord be given. The mess sent a happier fate. <laughs> Since I need not now admit it, I'll say not. He is my son. The strangers who have wandered hither, you are free. I give your feet a thousand kisses. I say misses, for a letter more or less twixt two friends is not considered. You have given me life, my lord, and since by your act I'm living, I eternally will own me as your slave. The life I've given is not really your true life. For a man by birth uplifted, if he suffers an affront, actually no longer liveth. And supposing you have come here for revenge, as you have hinted, I have not then given you life, since you have not brought it with you. For no life disgraced is a life. Yes, I say it will rouse his spirit. I confess I have it not though by you it has been given me. But revenge being wrecked, my honor I will leave so pure and limpid, all its perils overcome, that my life may then with fitness seem to be a gift of yours. Take this burnished sword, which hither you brought with you, for I know to revenge you tis sufficient in your enemy's blood bathed red. For a sword that once was girded round me, I, I say this the while that it was to me committed, and um, will know how to write you. Thus, in your name once more I gird it, and on it my revenge, my vengeance swear, though the enemy who afflicts me were more powerful. Is he so? Yes, so powerful I am hindered, saying who he is not doubting even for greater things your wisdom and calm prudence, but through fear, lest against me your prize pity might be turned. Oh, 
which will rather be by declaring it more kindled. Otherwise you bar the passage against your foe of my assistance. Did I but knew his name? Not to think I set so little value on such confidence. Know my enemy and my victim is no less than Prince Astolfo, Duke of Muscovy. Resistance badly can my grief supply, since it is heavier than I figured. Let's sift the matter deeper. Um, if a Muscovite by birth, then he who is your natural lord could not against you have committed any wrong. Reseek your country, abandon the wild impulse that has driven you here. I know, though a prince, he has committed against me a great wrong. He could not, even although your face was stricken by his angry hand. Heavens. Mine's a wrong more deep and bitter. Tell it then, it cannot be worse than what my fancy pictures. I will tell it. Though I know not with the respect your presence gives me, with the affection you awaken, with the esteem your worth elicits, how with bold face here to tell you that this outer dress is simply an enigma, since it is not what it seems. And from this hint then, if I'm not what I appear, and Astolfo with this princess comes to wed, judge how by him I was wronged, I've said sufficient. Listen, hear me, wait, oh, stay. The labyrinthine thicket is all this. Reason gives not a thread whereby to issue. My own honor here is wronged, powerful is my foe's position. I a vassal, she a woman? Reveal some way in pity, though I doubt it as the power. Such confused abysses. Heaven is all one fearful presage. The world itself a riddle. End of Act One. Act Two, Hall in the Royal Palace. Everything has been effected as you ordered. How all happened, let me know, my good Clotaldo. It was done, sire, in this manner. With the tranquilizing drop, which was made as you commanded, of confections duly mixed with some herbs, whose juice extracted has a strange tyrannic power, has some secret force imparted, which all human sense and speech robs, deprives, and counteracteth, and as twere a living corpse leaves the man whose lips have quaffed it, so asleep that all his senses, all his powers are overmastered. I have no need have we to discuss that this fact can really happen, since, my lord, experience gives us many a clear and proved example. It's certain it is that nature's secrets may by medicine be extracted, and that not an animal, not a stone or herb that's planted, but some special quality doth possess. For if the malice of man's heart, a thousand poisons, a thousand poisons that give death hath power to examine. Is it then so great a wonder that their venom being extracted? If, as death by some is given, sleep by others is imparted? Putting then aside the doubt that tis possible this should happen, a thing proved beyond all question, both by reason and example. Um, well, with the sleeping draught, in fine, made of opium superadded to the poppy and the henbane, I to Sigismund's apartment, Cell, in fact, went down, and with him spoke a while upon the grammar of the sciences, those first studies which mute nature's gentle masters, silent skies and hills had taught him, in which school divine and ample the bird's song, the wild beast's roar were a lesson and a language. And then, to raise his spirit more to the high design you planned here, I discoursed on, as my theme, the swift flight, the stare undazzled of a pride-plumed eagle bold, which, with back-diverted talons, scorning the tame fields of air, seeks the sphere of fire, and passes through its flame a flash of feathers, or a comet's hair untangled. I, I extolled its soaring flight, saying, Thou at last art master of thy house, thou art king of birds, it is right thou shouldst surpass them. He who needed nothing more than to touch upon the matter of high royalty, 
with a bearing as became him, boldly answered, for in truth his princely blood moves, excites, inflames his ardor to attempt great things. He said, in the restless realm of atoms given to birds, that even one should swear fealty as a vassal. I, reflecting upon this, am consoled by my disasters, for at least if I obey, I obey through force. Untrammeled, free to act, I ne'er will own any man on earth my master. This his usual theme of grief, having roused him nigh to madness, I occasion took to proffer the drugged draught. He drank, but hardly had the liquor from the vessel passed into his breast. The fastest sleep his senses seized, a sweat as cold as ice, the lifeblood hardened in his veins. His limbs grew stiff, so that, knew I not, t'was acted, death was there. Fiend, death, his life, I could doubt not, had departed. Then those to whose care you trust this experiment, in a carriage brought him here, where all things fitting the high majesty and the grandeur of his person are provided. In the bed of your state chamber they have placed him, where the stupor, having spent its force and vanished, they, as twere yourself, my lord, him will serve as you commanded. And if my obedient service seems to merit some slight largess, I would ask but this alone, my presumption you will pardon, that you tell me, with what object have you in this secret manner to your palace brought him here? Good Clotaldo, what you ask me is so just, to you alone I will give full satisfaction. Sigismund, my son, the hard influence of his hostile planet, as you know, doth threat a thousand dreadful tragedies and disasters. I desire to test if heaven, an impossible thing to happen, could have lied. If heaven given, having given us proofs unnumbered, countless samples of his evil disposition, he might prove more mild, more guarded at the last, and self-subdued by his prudence and true valor change his character. For tis man alone, man that alone controls the planets. This is what I wish to test. Having brought him to this palace, where he'll learn that he is my son and display his natural talents, if he nobly hath subdued him, he will reign. But if his manners show him tyrannous and cruel, then his chains once more shall clasp him. But for this experiment now, you will probably ask me of what moment was to bring him thus asleep and in this manner, and I wish to satisfy you, giving all your doubts an answer. If today he learns that he is my son and some hours after finds himself once more restored to his misery and his shackles, certain that from his temper blank despair may end in madness, but once knowing who he is, can he be consoled thereafter? Yes, and thus I wish to leave one door open one free passage by declaring all he saw was a dream. Hmm? With this advantage, we attain two ends. The first is to put beyond all civil, to put beyond all cavil his condition, for upon waking he will show his thoughts, his fancies, his fancies. To console him is the second. Since although obeyed and flattered, he beholds himself a while and then back in prison shackled finds him, he will think he dreamed, and he rightly so may fancy for Clotaldo in this world, all who live but dream they act here. Reasons fail me not to show that the experiment may not answer. There is no remedy now. A sign from the apartment tells me that he hath awoken, and hither word advances. It is best that I retire, but do you, so long his master near him stand, the, the wild confusion that his waking sense may dark and dissipate by simple truth. Then your license you have granted that I may declare it? Yes, for it possibly may happen that admonished of his danger, he may conquer his worst passions. Four good blows are all it cost me to come here, inflicted smartly by a red-robed halberdier with a beard to match his jacket. At that price, I see the show. 
for no windows half so handy as that which, without entreating tickets of the ticket master, a man carried with himself. Since for all the feasts and galas, cruel effrontery is the window, whence at ease he gazes at them. This is Clarine, uh, heavens, of her, yes, I say of her, the valet. She who, who dealing in misfortunes, has my pain to Poland carried. Any news, friend Clarine? News? Yes, sir, since your great compassion is disposed with Sarah's outrage to revenge, she has changed her habit and resumed her proper dress. It is quite right, huh? lest possible scandal might arise. Uh, more news. Her name having changed and wisely bartered for your niece's name, she now so in honor has advanced her that among Estrella's ladies, she here with her in the palace lives. It is right that I once more should her honor be established. Uh, news that anxiously she waiteth for that very thing to happen, when you may have time to try it. Most discreetly has she acted. Soon the time will come, believe me, happily to end this matter. News, too, that she's well regaled, feasted like a queen, and flattered on the strength of being your niece. And the last news, and the saddest, is that I, who came here with her, am with hunger almost famished. None remember me or think I am Clarine, Clarion, rather, and that if that clarion sounded, all the court would know what passes. For there are two things to wit, a brass clarion and a lackey that are bad at keeping secrets, and it so may chance, if haply I am forced to break my silence, they of me may sing this passage. Never, when the day is clear, does clarion sound more clear. Your complaint is too well founded. I will get to you satisfaction. Meanwhile, you may wait on me. See, sir, Sigismund advances. Yeah. Sigismund enters, lost in amazement. Servants minister to him, presenting costly robes. Help me, Anne. What's this I see? Help me, Anne. What's this I view? Things I scarce believe are true. But if True, which fright not me. I in palaces of state, I need silks and cloth of gold. I around me to behold rich robed servants watch and wait. I so soft a bed to press, while sweet sleep my senses bowed. I to wake in such a crowd who assist me even to dress. T'were deceit to say I dream. Waking, I recall my lot. I am Sigismund, am I not? Heaven make plain what dark doth see. Tell me, what has fantasy, wild misleading dream adept, so effected while I slept, that I still the phantom see? But let that be as it may, why perplex myself and brood? Better taste the present good, come what will some other day. What a sadness doth oppress him. Who in such like case would be less surprised and sad than he? I, for one. You had best address him. May they sing again? No, no, I don't care to hear them sing. I conceived the, the song might bring to you thought some ease. Not so. Voices that but charm the ear cannot soothe my sorrow's pain. Tis the soldier's martial strain that alone I love to hear. May your highness, mighty prince, uh, deign to let me kiss your hand. I would first of all this land by profound respect evince. Tis my jail. How can he change his harshness and neglect to this language of respect? What can have occurred to me? The new state in which I find you must create a vague surprise. Uh, doubts unnumbered must arise to bewilder and blind you. I would make your prospect fair. Through the maze a path would show. Thus, my lord, 
his right, you know, that you are the prince and heir of this Polish realm. If late you lay hidden and concealed, twas that we were forced to yield to the stern decrees of fate. Which strange ill I know not how threatened on this land to bring, should the laurel of the king never crown thy princely brow. Still uh, relying on the power of your will, the stars to bind. For a man of resolute mind can them bind, how dark they lower. To this palace from your cell, in your lifelong turret keep, they have borne you while dull asleep, held your spirit in its spell. Soon to see you and embrace comes the king, your father here. He will make the rest all clear. Why, thou traitor, vile and base, what need I to know the rest, since it is enough to know who I am my power to show, and the pride that fills my breast? Why this treason brought to light hast thou to thy country done, as to hide from the king's son gainst all reason and all right this is rank? O oh, destiny! Thou the traitor's part hast played gainst the law, the king betrayed and done cruel wrong to me. Thus, for each distinct offence, have the law, the king, and I, thee condemned this day to die by my hand. Prince? No pretense shall undo the debt I owe you. Caitiff, hence, by heaven I say, if you dare to stop my way, from the window I will throw you. Fly, Colotto! Woe to thee, in thy proud so pride so powerful see me without knowing thou art dreaming think away don't trouble me he could not the king deny bade to do a wrongful thing he should have refused the king and besides his prince was i twas not his affair to try if the act was wrong or right you're indifferent black or white since so pertly you reply what the prince says is quite true. What you do is wrong, I say. Who gave you this license, pray? No one gave. I took it. Who art thou speak? Ah, uh, a meddling fellow, prating, prying, fond of scrapes, general of all jackanapes, and most merry when most mellow. You alone in this new sphere have amused me. <laughs> That's quite true, sir, for I am the great amuser of all Sigismunds who are here. thousand tunes be blessed today, prince that gives thee to our sight, a son of Poland whose glad light makes this whole horizon gay, as when from the rosy fountains of the dawn the stream rays run, since thou issuest like the sun from the bosom of the mountains, and though late do not defer with thy sovereign lights to shine round thy brow the laurel twine, a deathless crown. God guard thee, sir. In not knowing me, I or her look, but alone for this defect, this response that lacks respect and due honor. Muscovy's duke am I, and your cousin born. Thus, my equal, I regard thee. Dig there, when I said God guard thee, lie concealed some latent scorn. Then if so, now having got thy big name and seeing thee vexed, when thou comest to see me next, I will say, God, God guard thee not. Think, your highness, if he errs, thus his mountain's birth at fault, every word is an assault. To do Alfonso, sir, prefers. Tut! His talk became a bore. Nay, his act was worse than that. He presumed to wear his hat. As grandy. But I am more. Nevertheless, respect should be much more marked betwixt ye two, the twixt others. And pray who asked your meddling thus with me? Welcome may your highness be, welcomed off to this thy throne, which long longing for its own finds at length its joy in thee, where, in spite of bygone fears, may your reign be great and bright, and your life in its long flight count by ages, not by years. Tell me thou, 
say, who can be this supreme of loveliness, goddess in a woman's dress, at whose feet divine we see heaven its choicest gifts doth lay? This sweet maid, her name declare. And tis your star-named cousin fair. <laughs> Nay, the sun to her best to say. Though thy sweet felicitation adds new splendor to my throne, Tis for seeing thee alone that I merit gratulation. Therefore I a prize have drawn that I scarce deserved to win, and am doubly blessed therein. Star, that in the rosy dawn dimmest with the transcendent ray, orbs that brightest gem the blue, what is left the sun to do when thou risest with the day? Give me then thy hand to kiss in whose cup of snowy whiteness drinks the day's delicious brightness. <gasps> what a courtly speech is this! <laughs> and if he takes her hand, I feel I am lost. Astolfo's grief I perceive and bring relief. Think, my lord, excuse my zeal, that perhaps this is too free since Alfonso... Did I say woe to him that stops my way? What I said was just. To me, this is tiresome and absurd. Naught is just or good or ill in my sight that balks my will. Why, my lord, yourself I heard. Say it, say it any righteous thing, it was proper to obey. You must too have heard me say, him I would from window throw, who should tease me or defy. Men like me, perhaps, might show that could not be done, sir. No? Then by heaven at least I'll try! Oh, what is this I see? Oh, whoa! Oh, prevent him! Oh, follow me. From the window into the sea he hath fallen, I told him so. Uh, these strange bursts of savage malice you should regulate if you can. Wild beasts are to civilized man as rude mountains to a palace. Take a bit of advice for that. Pause ere such bold words are said, lest you may not have a head upon which to hang your hat. What's all this? A trifling thing. One who teased and thwarted me, I have just thrown to the sea. No, my lord, it is the king. Ere the first day's sun hath set, has thy coming cost a life? Why, he dared me to the strife, and I only won the bet. Prince, my grief indeed is great, coming here when I had thought that admonished thou wert taught to o'ercome the stars and fate, still to see such rage abide in the heart I hoped was free, that thy first sad act should be a most fearful homicide? How could I? By love conducted, trust me to thine arms embracing when their haughty interlacing has already been instructed how to kill. For who could see, say some dagger bare and bloody by some wretch's heart made ruddy but would fear it? Who is he who may happen to behold on the ground the gory strain where another man was slain but must shudder? The most bold yields at once to nature's laws, thus I, Seeing in your arms the dread weapon that alarms and the stain must fain withdraw. And though in embraces, dear, I would press you to my heart. I without them must depart, for alas, your arms I fear. Well, without them I must stay, as I've stayed for many a year. For a father so severe who could treat me in this way, whose unfeeling heart could tear me from his side, e'en when a child who a denizen of the wild as a monster there could rear me, and by many an artful plan sought my death, it cannot grieve me much his arms will not receive me, who has scarcely left me mad. Would to God it had not been the acts of mine that name conferred, then thy voice I ne'er had heard, then thy boldness ne'er had seen. Did you manhood's right retain, I would then have naught to say. But to give and take away gives me reason to complain. For although to give with grace is the noblest act amongst men, to take the gift back again is the basest of the base. This 
then is thy grateful mood for my changing thy sad lot to a prince's? And for what should I show my gratitude? Tyrant of my will or throne, if thou, hoary art and grey, dying, what dost give me? Say, dost thou give what's not mine own? Thou my father and my king. Then the pomp these walls present comes to me by due descent as a simple natural thing. Yes, this sunshine pleaseth me, but tis not through thee I bask. Nay, a reckoning I might ask for the life, love, liberty that through thee I've lost so long. Thine, tis rather to thank me that I do not claim from thee compensation for my wrong. Still untamed and uncontrolled. Ha! Huh. Heaven fulfills his word, I feel. I to that same court appeal against thy taunts, thou vain and bold. But although the truth thou'st heard and now know'st thy name and race, and do to see thee in this place where to all, where to all thou art preferred, yet be warned and on thee take ways more mild and more beseeming, for perhaps thou art but dreaming when it seems thou art awake. Is this then a phantom scene? Do I wake in seeming show? No, I dream not, since I know what I am and what I be. And although thou shouldst repent thee, remedy is now too late. Who I am I know, and fate, howsoe'er thou shouldst lament thee, cannot take me from my right of being born this kingdom's heir. If I saw myself erewhile prisoned, bound, kept out of sight, was that never on my mind dawned the truth. But now I know who I am, a mingled show of the man and beast combined. To wait upon Astraea I come here, and lest I meet Astolfo tremble with much fear. Clotaldo's wishes are the duke should know me not, and for afar see me, if see he must. My honour is at stake, he says, my trust is in Clotaldo's truth. He will protect my honour and my youth. Of all this palace here can boast, all that you yet have seen, say, which has pleased you most? Nothing surprised me, nothing scared, because for all I was prepared, but if I felt for aught or more or less of admiration, t'was the loveliness of woman. I have read somewhere in books on which my spirit fed, that which caused God the greatest care to plan, because in him a little world he formed was man. If this were truer said, unless I err, of woman, for a little heaven he made in her. She who in beauty from her birth surpasses man as heaven surpasseth earth. Nay, hey, more the one I see. The prince is here. I must this instant flee. Here, woman, stay. Nor wed the western with the orient ray, flying with rapid tread. For join the orient rose and western red, the light and the cold gloom, the day will sink untimely to its tomb. But who is this I see? I doubt and yet believe that it is he. This beauty I have seen some other time. It's proud, majestic, me and this form I once saw bound within oh. the narrow cell. A life I found. Woman, the sweetest name that man can breathe or flattering language free. Who art thou? For before I see thee, I believe and I adore. Faith makes my love sublime, persuading me we've met some other time. Fair woman, speak. My will must be obeyed. In bright Astraea's train, a hapless maid, ye must not know my name. The sun, say rather, of that star whose flame, however bright its blaze, is but the pale reflection of thy rays. In the fair land of flowers, the realm of sweets that lies in odorous bars, the goddess rose I have seen, 
by right divine of beauty reign as queen. I have seen where the brightest shine gems, the assembled glories of the mind. The brilliant throng elect the diamond king, for the superior splendor it doth fling amid the halls of light, where the unresting star crowds meet at night. I have seen fair Hesper rise, and take the foremost place of all the skies, and in that higher zone where the sun calls the planets round his throne, I have seen with sovereign sway that he presides the oracle of the day. How then, mid flowers of earth or stars of air, mid stones or suns, if that which is most fair the preference gains canst thou? before a lesser beauty bend and bow, when thine own charms compose something more bright than sun, stone, star, or rose. The Prince Sigismund devolves on me because twas I who reared him. What do I see? Thy favor, sir, I prize, to thee the silence of my speech replies, for when the reason's dull, the mind depressed, he best doth speak who keeps his silence best. You must not leave me. Stay. What? Would you rob my senses of the ray your beauteous presence gave? That license from your highness I must crave. The violent efforts that you make show that you do not ask the leave you take. I hope to take it if it is not given. You rouse my courtesy to rage by him. In me resistance, as it were, distills a cruel poison that my patience kills. Then though that poison may be strong, the source of fury, violence, and wrong, potent thy patience to subdue, it dare not the respect to me that's due. As if to show I may, you take the terror of your charms away. For I am but too prone to attempt the impossible. I today have thrown out of this window one who said, like you, I dare not do the thing I said I'd do. Now, just to show I can, I may throw out your honor as the man. More obstinate doth he grow. What course to take, oh heavens, I do not know. When wild desire, when crime perils my honor for the second time. Not vainly, as I see, this hapless land was warned thy tyranny in fearful scandals would eventuate in wrath, in wrong, in treachery, rage, and hate. But who in truth could claim aught from a man who was but a man in name, audacious, cruel, cold, inhuman, proud, tyrannical, and bold, among beasts a wild beast born? It was to save me from such words of scorn, so courteously I spoke, thinking to bind you by a gentler yoke. But if I am in aught what you have said, then, as God lives, I will be all you dread. Ho oh, there, leave us. See to it at your cost. This door be locked. Let no one in. I'm lost. Consider! I am a despot, and tis vain you strive to move me, or my will restrain. Oh, what a moment of an agony! I will go forth and stop him, though I die. But my lord, I consider stay a second time you dare to cross my way oh doted do you hold my rage in such slight awe you are so bold what brought you hither speak the accents of this voice are however weak to tell you to restrain your passions if as king you wish to reign not to be cruel though you deem yourself the lord of all all may be a dream you but provoke my rage by these old sores, the unwelcome light of age and killing you, at least I'll see if tis a dream or truth. So hope for me to save my life is thus to humbly kneel. Take your audacious hand from off my steel. So some kind aid be sent to someone come who may your rage prevent. I will not loose my hold. Oh, heaven. I say, loose it, old dotard, grim and gaunt and grey, or by another death. I'll crush you in my arms while you have breath. 
Quick! Quick! There's Legotaldo! Help! Oh, help! Golfo enters, and at this moment, Gotaldo falls at his feet. This strange affray, what can it mean, magnanimous prince? Would you so bright a blade imbrue in blood that age already doth congeal? Back to its sheath return the shining steel. Yes, when it is bathed red in his base blood. This threatened life hath fled for sanctuary to my feet. I must protect that poor retreat. Protect your own life, then. For in this way, striking at it, I will the grudge repay I owe you for the past. I thus defend my life, but majesty will not offend. Wound him not, my lord. Swords flashing here. Oh, Astolfo is engaged. Oh, pain severe. What caused this quarrel? Speak, say why. Tis nothing now, my lord, since thou art by. Tis much, although thou art now by, my lord. I wish to kill this old man with my sword. Did you not then respect these snow-white hairs? My lord will recollect they scarce deserved it. Be in mind. Who dares to ask of me do I respect white hairs? Your own some day my feet may trample in the public roadway. For I have not as yet revenged my wrong, your treatment so unjust, and my sad state so long. But ere that dawn doth break, you must return to sleep. When, where when you wake, all that hath happened here will seem, as is the glory of the world, a dream. Ah, oh, how rarely fate doth lie when it's some misfortune threatens. Dubious when tis good that's promised, when tis evil, ah, too certain. What a good astrologer would he be, whose art foretelleth only cruel things, for doubtless they would turn out true forever. This in Sigismund and me is exemplified, Estrella, since between our separate fortunes such a difference is presented. In his case, had been foreseen murders, misery, and excesses, and in all they turned out true, since all happened as expected. But in mine, here seeing, lady, rays so rare and so resplendent that the sun is but their shadow, and even heaven a faint resemblance, when fate promised me good fortune, trophies, praises, and all blessings, it spoke ill, and it spoke well, for it was of both expressive, when it held out hopes of favor, but disdain alone affected. Oh, I doubt not these fine speeches are quite true, although intended, doubtless, for that other lady, she whose portrait was suspended from your neck when first Astolfo at this court here you addressed me. This being so, tis she alone who these compliments deserveth. Go and pay them to her self for like bills that are protested in the counting house of love are those flatteries and finenesses which to other kings and ladies have been previously presented. Well, thank God my miseries have attained their lowest level, since by her who sees this sight, nothing worse can be expected. Then that portrait from my breast shall be taken, that thy perfect beauty there may reign instead. For where bright Estrella enters, shadow cannot be, or star, where the sun, I go to fetch it. Uh, Pardon, beautiful Rosara, <laughs> this offense, the absent never, man or woman, as his this shows, the faith of plighted vows remember. Not a single word I heard, being afraid they might observe me. Oh, Estrella. My good lady. Nothing could have pleased me better than your timely coming here. I have something confidential to entrust with you. Your... You honor far too much my humble service. 
brief as is the time, Estrella, I have known you, you already of my heart possess the keys. Tis for this and your own merits that I venture to entrust you with what I oft have attempted from myself to hide. Your slave. Then concisely to express it. No, Astolfo, my first cousin. Um, Tis enough that word to mention for some things may be best said when not spoken, but suggested. Soon expects to wed with me. If my fate so far relenteth as that by one single bliss, all past sorrows may be lessened. I was troubled the first day that we met to see suspended from his neck a lady's portrait. On, on the point, I urged him uh, gently. He so courteously and polite went immediately to get it and will bring it here. From him, I should feel quite disconcerted to receive it. Um, you here stay and request him to present it unto you. I say no more. You are beautiful and clever. You must know what to what is love. Would I knew it not. Oh, help me now, kind heaven. For who could be so prudential, so collected, as to know how best to act in so painful a dilemma? Is there in the world a being? Is there one a more inclement heaven has marked with more misfortunes? Has been more of sorrow centered? What bewildered shall I do when tis vain to be expected that my reason can console me or consoling be my helper? From my earliest misfortune, everything that I've attempted has been but one misery more. Each, the other's sad successor, all inheritors of themselves. Thus, the phoenix they resemble, one is from the other born, new life springs where old life endeth, and the young are warmly cradled by the ashes of the elder. Once, a wise man called them cowards, seeing that misfortunes never have been so to come alone. But I call them brave, intrepid, who go straight unto their end and ne'er turn their backs in terror. By the man who brings them with him, everything may be attempted, since he need on no occasion have the fear of being deserted. I may say so. Since at all times, whatsoever life presented, I, without them, never saw me. Nor will they grow weary ever till they see me in death's arm, wounded by faith's final weapon. Woe is me! But what today shall I do in this emergency? If I tell my name, Clotaldo, unto whom I am indebted for my very life and honor, may be with me much offended, since he said my reparation must in silence be expected. If I tell not to a Stolfo who I am, and he detects me, how can I dissemble then? For although a feigned resemblance, eyes and voice and tongue might try, Truthful heart would tremble and expose the lie. But wherefore study what to do? Tis certain that, however I may study, think beforehand how to nerve me when at last the occasion comes, then alone what grief suggests that I will do. For no one holds in his power the heart's distresses. And thus what to say or do as my soul cannot determine. Grief must only reach today its last limit. Pain be ended, and at last an exit make from the doubts that so perplex me how to act. But until then, help me, heaven! Oh, deign to help me. Here then is the portrait, princess. Oh, but good God! Your highness trembles. What has startled, what surprised you? The Rosara, to see present. Rosara, oh, your highness is deceived by some resemblance, doubtless to some other lady. I'm Astrea, one who merits not the glory of producing an emotion so excessive. Ah, uh, Rosara, thou mayst feign, but the soul bears no deception, and 
those seeing thee as Australia, as Rosara, it must serve thee. I, not knowing what your highness speaks of, am of course prevented from replying aught but this, that Estrella, the bright Hesper of this sphere, was pleased to order that I here should wait, expectant for that portrait, which to me she desires you give it present. For some reason, she prefers it through me should be presented. So, Estrella, say my star, wishes, so a fate relentless wills, in things that brings me loss, so Estrella now expecteth. Though such efforts you attempt, and still how badly you dissemble, my Rosara, tell the eyes in their music to keep better concert with the voice, because any instrument whatever would be out of tune that sought to combine and blend together the true feelings of the heart with the false words speech expresses. I wait only, as I said, for the portrait. Since you're bent, then, to the end to keep this tone, uh, I adopt it and dissemble. Tell the princess, then, Astrea, that I so esteem her message that to send her a copy seems to me so slight a present. Also, highly it is valued by myself. I think it better to present the original and you easily may present it since, in point of fact, you bring it with you in your own sweet person. When it has been undertaken by a man bold, brave, determined to obtain a certain object, though he get perhaps a better, still not bringing back the first, he returns despised. I beg then that your highness give the portrait I without it dare not venture. How then, if I do not give it, will you get it? I will get it thus, ungrateful! Tis in vain. It must not be seen, though never, in another woman's hands. Thou art dreadful. How deceptive! Oh, enough, Rosara, mine. Thine, thou liest, base deserter! Prince? Astrea? What is this? Heavens. Astrea. Love, befriend me, give me wit enough my portrait to regain. If thou wouldst learn then. Astrea, what the matter is, my lady, I will tell thee. Okay. Wouldst overwhelm me? You commanded me to wait here for the prince and representing you to get from him a portrait I remained alone, expecting, and as often by one thought is some other thought suggested. Seeing that you spoke of portraits, I, reminded thus, remembered that I had one of myself in my sleeve. I wished to inspect it, for a person quite alone, even by trifles, is diverted. From my hand I let it fall on the ground. The prince who entered with the other lady's portrait raised up mine, but so rebellious was he to what you had asked him that instead of his presenting one, he wished to keep the other. Since he mine will not surrender to my prayers and my entreaties, angry at this ill-timed jesting, I endeavored to regain it. That which in his hand is held there is my portrait, if you see it. You can judge of the resemblance. Duke, at once give up the portrait. Takes it from his hand. Princess. Well... The tints were blended by no cruel hand, methinks. Is it like me? Like? Tis perfect. Now, demand from him the other. Take your own, and leave our presence. I've got my portrait back. Come what may, I am contented. Give me now the other portrait. For although perhaps I never may again address or see you, I desire not, no, no, to let it in your hands remain, if only for my folly in requesting you to give it. Oh, escaped from this singular dilemma. <clears throat> Though I wish, most beauteous princess, to obey thee and mm -hmm. to serve thee, still I cannot give the portrait thou dost ask for, since... A wretched and false-hearted lover art thou. Now, I wish it not presented, 
So give to thee no pretext for reminding me that ever I had asked it at thy hands. Hear me. Listen, wait. I remember. God, what hast thou done, Rosara? Why or wherefore on what errand to destroy thyself and me hast thou Poland rashly entered? Scene shifts to the prison of the prince and the tower. Sigismund, as at the commencement, is clothed in skins, chained and lying on the ground, and enter Clotaldo, two servants, and Clarine. Leave him here on the ground, where his day, its pride being o'er, finds its end too. As before, with a chain, his feet are bound. Never from that sleep profound wake, O Sigismund, or rise, to behold with wondering eyes all thy glorious life o'erthrown, like a shadow that hath flown, like a bright brief flame that dies. One who can so wisely make such reflections on this case should have ample time and space, even for Solon's sake, to discuss it. Him you'll take to this cell here and keep bound. But, but why me? Because tis found safe when clarions secrets know, clarions to lock up, but so they may not have power to sound. Did I, since you treat me thus, try to kill my father? No. Did I from the window throw that unlucky Icarus? Is my drink somniferous? Do I dream? Then why be bent? Tis a clarion's punishment. Then a horn of low degree, yea, a cornet, I will be a safe, silent instrument. They take him away, and Clotaldo remains alone. Hark, Clotildo. My lord, here, uh, uh, thus disguised, your majesty. Foolish curiosity leads me in this lowly gear to find out. Ah, me, with fear how the sudden change he bore. There, behold him as before in his miserable state. Wretched prince, unhappy fate, birth by vain, baneful stars watched o'er. Go in and wake him cautiously, now that strength and force lie chained by the opiate he hath drained. Muttering something restlessly, see, he lies. Let's listen. He may some few clear words repeat. Perfect prince is he whose heap smites the tyrant where he stands. Yes, Clotaldo dies by my hands. Yes, my sire shall kiss my feet. Death he threatens in his rage. Outrage vile he doth intend. He, my life, has sworn to end. He hath vowed to insult my age. Oh, on the mighty world's great stage, mid the admiring nation's cheer, valor mine that has no peer. Into thou, thou slave so shunned, now shall reign Prince Sigismund, and his sire is reproach all fear. Oh, but, ah, uh, me, where am I? Me, oh. I not, me, I must not let him see. Lean, listening close by, I will be. What you have to do, you know. Can it possibly be so? Is the truth not what it seemed? Am I chained and unredeemed? Art not thou my lifelong tome, dark old tower? Yes, what a doom. God. What wondrous things I dreamed. Oh, in this delusive play must my special part be taken. Is it not full time to waken? Yes, to waken well it may. Wilt thou sleep the live long day? Since we gazing from below saw the eagle sailing slow, soaring through the azure sphere, all the time thou waited here, didst thou never waken? Oh. Nor even now am I awake, since such thoughts my memory fill, that it seems I'm dreaming still. 
Or is this a great mistake? Since if dreams could phantoms make things of actual substance seen, I think seen may phantoms deep. Thus a double harvest reaping, I can see when I am sleeping, and when waking I can dream. What you may have dreamed of, say? If I thought it only seemed, I would tell not what I dreamed, but what I beheld I may. I woke, and lo, I lay, cruel and delusive thing, in a bed whose covering bright with blooms from rosy bars seemed a tapestry of flowers woven by the hand of spring. Then a crowd of nobles came who addressed me by the name of their prince, presenting me gems and robes on bended knee. Calm soon left me and my frame thrilled with joy to hear thee tell of the fate that me befell. For though now in this dark den, I was Prince of Poland then. Doubtless you repaid me well. <sighs> Not well, for calling thee traitor vile in furious strife, twice I strove to take thy life. But why all this rage against me? I was master, and would be well revenged on foe and friend. Love one woman could defend. That, at least for truth I deem, all else ended like a dream. That alone can never end. From this place the king hath gone, touched by his pathetic words, <clears throat> Speaking of the king of birds, soaring to ascend his throne, thou didst fancy one thy own. But in dreams, however bright, thou shouldst still have kept in sight how for years I tended thee. For twere well, whoe'er we be, even in dreams, to do what's right. <sighs> that is true. And let's restrain this wild rage, this fierce condition of the mind, this proud ambition, should we ever dream again. And we'll do so, since tis plain in this world's uncertain gleam, that to live is but to dream. Man dreams what he is, and wakes only when upon him breaks death's mysterious morning being. The king dreams he is a king, and in this delusive way lives and rules with sovereign sway. All the cheers that round him ring, born on air, of air on air take wing. And in ashes, mournful fate, death dissolves his pride and state. Who would wish a crown to take? seeing that he must awake in the dream beyond death's gate. And the rich man dreams of gold, gilding cares it scarce conceals. And the poor man dreams he feels want and misery and cold. Dreams he too, who rank would hold. Dreams who toil, who bears toil's rough ribbed hands. Dream who, dreams who wrong for wrong demand. And in fine, throughout the earth, all men dream, whatever their birth. And yet no one understands. Tis a dream that I in sadness here am bound, the scorn of fate. Twas a dream that once in state I enjoyed of light and gladness. What is life? Tis but a madness. What is life, a thing that seems? A mirage that falsely gleams, phantom joy, delusive rest. Since life is a dream at best, and even dreams themselves are dreams. <sighs> End of Act Two. Act Three Within the Tower.
in a strange enchanted tower. I, for what I know, am imprisoned. How would ignorance be punished if for knowledge they would kill me? What a thing to die of hunger for a man who loves good living. I compassionate myself. All will say, I well believe it, and it well may be believed. Because silence is a virtue incompatible with my name, Clarine, which of course forbids it. In this place, my sole companions, it may safely be predicted, are the spiders and the mice. What a pleasant nest of myths. Owing to this last night's dream, my poor head, I feel quite dizzy from a thousand clarinets, shams and seraphines and symbols, crucifixes and processions, flagellants who so well whipped them that as up and down they went, some even fainted as they witnessed how the blood ran down the others. I, if the truth may whisper, simply fainted from not eating. For I see me in this prison all day wondering how this pole in such a hungry look exhibits all night reading in the fasty by some half-starved poet written. In the calendar of saints, if a new one is admitted, then Saint Secret be my patron, for I fast upon his vigil. Though it must be owed, I suffer justly for the fault committed, since a servant to be silent is a sacrilege most sinful. He is here within the tower. Dash the door from off its hinges. Good God, tis certain that tis me they seek so briskly. Since they say that I am here, what can they require? Go in there. Here he is. He's not. Great Lord. Great Lord. Are the fellows not or tipsy? Thou art our own prince, and we will not have and won't admit of any but our natural prince. We no foreign prince here wish for. Let us kneel and kiss thy feet. Live, long live, live our, best our best princes. princes. God, the affair grows rather serious. Is it usual in this kingdom to take some out, someone out each day? Make him prince and then remit him to this tower. It must be so since each day that sight I witness. I must therefore play my part. Thy feet give, feet us. give us. I can't give them as I want them for myself. For a prince to be a cripple would be rather a defect. We have all conveyed our wishes to your father. We have told him you alone shall be our prince here, not the Duke. And were you guilty against my sire of disrespect? was the loyalty of our spirit. If t'was lo loyalty, I forgive you. Come, regain thy lost dominion. Long live Sigismund. Live the prince. The prince. Say they Sigismund? Good, admitted. Sigismund must be the name given to all pretended princes. Who has named here Sigismund? Ah, uh, I'm but an adult prince then. Who is Sigismund? Whom? I. Now oh, then, didst thou, bold and silly, dare to make thee Sigismund? I, a Sigismund, thou fibbest. It was you yourself that thus Sigismundized me and princed me. All the silliness and the boldness have been by yourselves committed. Great and brave Prince Sigismund, for thy bearing doth convince us Thou art he, although on faith we proclaim thee as our prince here. King Basilis, thy father, fearful of the heavens fulfilling a prediction which declared he would see himself submitted at thy victor feet, attempts to deprive thee of thy birthright and to give it to Astolfo, Muscovy's duke. For this his missives summoned all his court, the people understanding by some instinct that they had a natural king, did not wish a foreign princeling to rule over them. And tis thus that the fate for thee predicted, treating with a noble scorn, they have sought thee where imprisoned thou dost live, that issuing forth by their powerful arms assisted from this tower, thy crown and scepter thou shouldst thus regain, and quit them of a stranger and a tyrant. Forth then, for among these cliffs here there is now a numerous army formed of soldiers and banditti that invoke thee, 
freedom waits thee to the thousand voices listen. Long, long live Prince Sigismund. Oh, once again, no heaven, wouldst wish me once again to dream of greatness, which may vanish in an instant, that a royal throne encircled, die, once again to see the glories that a royal throne encircled, die in darkness and in gloom like a flame the winds extinguish, once again by sad experience, to be taught the dangerous limits human power may overleap at its birth and while it liveth, no, it must not, must not be. See me now once more submitted to my fate, and since I know life is but a dream, a vision, hence ye phantoms that assume to my darkened sense the figure and the voice of life, although neither voice nor form is in them. I no longer now desire a feigned majesty, a fictitious and fantastic pomp, illusions which the slightest breath that ripples the calm ether could destroy. Even as in the early springtime when the flowering almond tree unadvisedly exhibits all its fleeting bloom of flowers, the first blast their freshness withers and the ornament and grace of its rosy locks disfigures. Now I know ye, know ye all, and I know the same false glimmer cheats the eyes of all who sleep. Me false shows no more we bewilder. Disabused I know now well life is but a dream, a vision. If thou thinkest we deceive thee, turn thine eyes to those proud cliffs there. See the crowds that wait there, willing, eager to obey thee. Yet just as clearly and distinctly, I have seen another time the same things that now I witness, and was but a dream. At all times, great events, my lord, bring with them their own omens, and thy dream but the actual fact prefigured. You say well, it was an omen. But supposing the bright vision even were true, since life is short, let us dream, my soul, a little, once again remembering now, with all forethought and prevision, that we once more, once more must awake, at a better time, not distant. The being known, the undeceiving, when it comes, will be less bitter, for it takes the sting from evil to anticipate its visit. And with this conviction, too, e'en with its certainty admitting that all power being only lent must return unto the giver, let us boldly then dare all. For the loyalty you exhibit, thanks, my lieges. See in me one who will this land deliver from a stranger's alien yellow yoke. Sound to arms. You soon shall witness what my valor can effect. Against my father I have lifted hostile arms to see if heaven has of me the truth predicted. At my feet I am to see him. But if I, from dreams delivered, wake here yeah, then, and nothing happens, silence now were more befitting. Long live the king. king. Uh, what tumult heavens has risen? Well, let all do Sire, upon me will his wrath now fall. He'll fling him headlong down this deep file. At your royal feet submitted, I know how to die. My father, rise, I pray, from that position, since to you, my guide and pole star, are my future acts committed. All my past life owes you much for your careful supervision. Come, embrace me. What do you say? That I dream, and that my wishes are to do what's right, since we, even in dreams, should do what's fitting. Then, my, my prince, if, if you adopt to acting rightly as your symbol, you will pardon me for asking, uh, so to act, that you permit me. No advice and no assistance can I give against my king. Better that my lord should kill me at his feet here. Oh, ungrateful, villain, wretch. 
but heavens. Tis fitter I restrain myself, not knowing but all this may be a vision. The fidelity I envy must be honored and admitted. Go and serve your lord, the king, where the battle rages thickest we shall meet. To arms, my friends. Thanks, most generous of princes. Fortune, we go forth to reign. Wake me not if this is vision. Let me sleep not if tis true. But whichever of them isn't, to act right is what imports me. If tis true, because it is so. If tis not, that when I waken, friends may welcome and forgive me. Who can expect Astolfo to restrain an untamed steed that wildly turns to flee? Who can the current of a stream detain that swollen with pride sweeps down to seek the sea? Who can prevent from tumbling to the plain some mighty peak the lightning's flash set free? Yet each were easier in its separate way than the rude mob's insensate rage to stay. The several bands that throng each green retreat, this truth proclaimed by their disparted cries. Astolfo, hear the echoing notes repeat, while there is Sigismund that rends the skies, the place where late the land was glad to greet this choice we made, a second adventure tries, and soon will be as horror o'er it leans, the fatal theater of tragic scenes. My lord, let all this joy suspended be, these plaudits cease, and to another day, defer the rapture thou hast promised me, for if this Poland, which I hope to sway, resists today my right of sovereignty, tis that by merit I should win my way. Give me a steed to stem this wild revolt, my pride shall be the flash that bears the bolt. Slight help there is for what is fixed by fate, and that much of danger to foresee the blow, if it must fall, defense is then too late, and he who most forestalls does most foreknow. Hard law, stern rule, dire fact to contemplate that he who thinks to fly doth nearer go. Thus, by the very means that I employed my country and myself, I have destroyed. If, mighty lord, thy presence, which it braves, the tumult of the crowd cannot defeat, the frenzy of the multitude that raves in hostile bands throughout every square and street, thou shalt see thy kingdom swim in crimson waves, a purple sea of blood shall round it beat, for even already in its dismal doom, all is disaster, tragedy, and gloom. Such is thy kingdom's ruin, so severe the hard and bloody trial fate hath sent. Dazed is the eye and terrified the ear. Dark grows the sun and every wind is spent. Each stone a mournful obelisk doth rear and every flower erects a monument. A grave seems every house whence life is gone. Each soldier is a living skeleton. Oh, speak to God, I reached thy feet alive. What news of Sigismund, Clotildo, say? Proud, whom frenzy and blind impulse drive, into the tower resistless burst their way. Released the prince, who, seeing thus revive the honor he had tasted for one day, looked brave, declaring in a haughty tone, the truth at last that heaven must now make known. Give me a horse. In person forth I'll ride to check the pride of this ungrateful son. Where science erred, let now the world decide. By uh, my own valor shall my throne be won. Let me the glory of the fight divide. A twinkling star besides that royal sun. Bologna matched with Mars. For I would dare to scale even heaven to rival palace there. Though the trumpets from afar echo in thy valorous breast, hear me, list to my request, 
for I know that all is war. Well, thou knowest that I came poor to Poland, sad, dejected, that graciously protected, though thy pity let me claim it was thy command. Oh, me, I should live here thus disguised, striving as thy words advised, hiding all my jealousy to avoid a stolful sight. But he saw me, and though seeing with Estrella, he false being, converse holds this very night in a garden bower, the key I have taken and will show you where by entering with a blow thou canst end my misery. Thus then, daring, bold, and strong, though my honor wilt restore, strike and hesitate no more. Let his death revenge my wrong. It is true, my inclination, since thou wert first seen by me, was to strive and do for thee. Be thy tears, my attestation, all my life could do to serve thee. What I first was forced to press was that thou shouldst change thy dress, lest if chancing to observe thee masquerading like a page, thy appearance is so strong, let astray the duke might wrong by a thought thy sex and age. Meanwhile, various projects held me in suspense, oft pondering o'er how thy honor to restore. Though thy honor so compelled me, I a Stolfo's life should take. Wild design that soon took wing. Yet, as he was not my king, it no terror could awake. I, his death was seeking, when Sigismund with vengeful aim sought for mine, Solfo came, and despising what most men would a desperate peril deem, stood in my defense. His bearing, night or rashness in its daring, showed the valor most extreme. How then think could I, whose breath is his gift in murderous strife, for his giving me my life, strive in turn to give him death? grateful yet aggrieved by two opposite feelings driven seeing it to thee have given and from him him have it received doubting this and that believing half revenging half forgiving if to thee i'm drawn by giving i to him am by receiving oh, thus bewildered and me set vainly seeks my love away since i have a debt to pay there i must exact a debt it is settled, I believe, as all men of spirit know that tis glorious to bestow, but a meanness to receive. Well, admitting this to be, then thy thanks should not be his, even supposing that he is one who gave thy life to thee, as the gift of life was thine, and from him the taking came, in this case the act of shame, and a glorious act in mine. Thus by him thou art aggrieved, and by me even complimented, since to me thou hast presented what from him thou hast received. Then, all hesitation leaving, though to guard my fame shouldst fly, since my honor is as high as is giving to receiving. Thou, oh, it seems a generous fever in a noble heart to give. Still, an equal fire may live in the heart of the receiver. Heartlessness is something hateful. I would boast a liberal name. So I put my highest claim in the fact of being grateful. And to me that title leave. Gentle birth breeds gentleness. For the honor is no less to bestow than to receive. I received my life from thee. But for thee, I now were dead. Said it was thyself that said, No insulted life could be called a life on that I stand. Not have I received from me, From the life no life could be, That was given me by thy hand. But if thou wouldst first be just, Ere being generous in this way, As I heard thyself once say, Thou will give me life, I trust, which thou hast not yet, and thus 
thanksgiving well enhance thee more, for if liberal before, thou wilt then be generous. Conquered by thy argument, liberal thy first will be. I, Rosara, will to thee all my property present. In a convent live. By me has the plan been weighed some time for escaping from a crime thou wilt there find sanctuary. So many ills present them through the land on every side that being nobly born, my pride is to strive and not augment them. By the choice that I have made, well, to the land I'll be. I am liberal with thee, and Stolfo's debt is paid. Choose then. Nay, let honor rather choose for thee, and for us too. For by heaven I could not do more for thee were I thy father. Were that supposition true, I might strive and bear this blow, but not being my father, no! What then dost thou mean to do? Kill the duke! Gentle dame, who no father's name doth know, can she so much valor show? Yes! What drives thee on? My fame. Think that in the duke thou'lt see. Honor all my wrath doth rouse. Soon thy king, a stray spouse. No, by heaven, it must not be. It is madness. Yes, I see it. Conquer it. I can't o'erthrow it. It will cost thee. Yes, I know it. Life and honor. Well, so be it. What wouldst have? My death. Oh, take care. It is spite. His honor's cure. His wildfire. That will endure. His frenzy. Rage, despair. Can there be nothing done this blind rage to let pass by? No. And who will help thee? I. There then no remedy. None. Think of other means whereby other means would seal my fate. If to so, then daughter, wait, for together we shall die. The scene shifts to the open plains. Enter Sigismund, clothed in skins, and soldiers marching. If Rome could see me on this day, amidst the triumphs of its early sway, oh, with what strange delight it would have seen so singular a sight, its mighty armies led by one who was a savage wild beast bred, whose courage soars so high that here an easy conquest seems the sky. But let us lower our flight, my spirit. Tis not thus we should invite this doubtful dream to stay. Lest when I wake and it has passed away, I learn to my sad cost. A moment given, twas in a moment lost. Determined not to abuse it, the less will be my sorrow should I lose it. Upon a rapid steed, excuse my painting it, I can't indeed resist the inspiration, which seems a moving mass of all creation, its body being the earth, the fire, the soul that in its heart hath birth, its foam the sea, its panting breath the air, chaos confused at which I stand and stare, since in its soul, foam, body, breath, to me it is a monster made of fire, earth, air, and sea. Its color dapple gray, speckled its skin, and flecked as well it may, by the impatient spur its flank that dies. For lo, it doth not run, the meteor flies, as borne upon the wind a beauteous woman seeks thee. Struck blind. Good God, it is Rosara, oh, the pain. Heaven has restored her to my sight again. Noble-hearted Sigismund, thou whose hidden light heroic issues from its night of shadows to the great deeds of its morning, and as heaven's sublimest planet 
From the white arms of Aurora, back restores their beauteous color to the wild flowers and the roses, and upon the seas and mountains, when in diademed with glory, scatters light, diffuses splendor, braids their foam, their hair makes golden. Thus thou donnest on the world, bright, auspicious son of Poland, who will help a hapless woman, she who at thy feet doth throw her, help her, since she is unhappy in a woman. Two good motives quite enough to move a man, who of valor so doth boast him, though even one would be sufficient, though even one would be all potent. Thou hast seen me thrice already, thrice thou hast not truly known me, for each time by different dresses was I strangely metamorphosed. First I seemed to thee a man, when within thy sad and somber cell thou sawest me, when thy life wild from me mine own misfortunes. As a woman next thou sawest me, where the splendors of thy throne room vanished like a fleeting vision, vain, phantasmal, and abortive. The third time is now, when being something monstrous and abnormal in a woman's dress thou seest me with a warrior's arms adorned, and to pity and compassion that thou mayest be moved more strongly, listen to the sad success of my tragical misfortunes. In the court of Muscovy, I was born of a noble mother, who indeed must have been fair, since unhappiness was her portion. Fond and too persuading eyes fixed on her, a traitor lover, whom not knowing I don't name, though mine own worth had informed me what was his, for being his image, I sometimes regret that fortune made me not a pagan born, that I might, in my wild folly, think he must have been some god such as he was, who in golden shower wooed Danae, or a swan letter loved a, as bull Europa. When I thought to lengthen out citing these perfidious stories, my discourse, I find already that I have succinctly told thee how my mother, being persuaded by the flatteries of love's homage, was as fair as any fair, and unfortunate as all are. But a ridiculous excuse of a plighted husband's promise so misled her that even yet the remembrance brings her sorrow. For that traitor, that Aeneas flying from his Troy, forgot there or left after him his sword. By this Sheath, its blade is covered, but it shall be naked drawn ere this history is over. From this loosely fastened, no which binds nothing, which ties nothing. Call it marriage, call it crime. Names in nature cannot alter. I was born a perfect image, a true copy of my mother in her loveliness. Oh, no, in her miseries and misfortunes. Therefore there is little need to say how the hapless daughter, heiress of such scant good luck, had her own peculiar portion. All that I will say to thee of myself is that the robber of the trophies of my fame, of the sweet spoils of my honor, is Astolfo. <laughs> to name him! stirs and rouses up the collar of the heart, a fitting effort when an enemy's name is spoken. Yes, Astolfo was that traitor who, forgetful of his promise, for when love has passed away, even its memory is forgotten, came to Poland, hither called, from so sweet, so proud a conquest, to be married to Estrella, of my setting sun the torch light who believe that when one star oft unites two happy lovers, now one star, Estrella, comes two to tear from one another? I offended, I deceived, sad remained, remained astonished, mad, half dead, remained myself. 
that's to say, in so much torment, my heart was like a babble of confusion, hell, and horror. I, resolving to be mute, there are some pains and sorrows that by feelings are expressed better than when words are spoken. I, by silence, spoke my pain, till one day, being with my mother, violent she, oh heavens, burst their prison like a torrent forth, they rushed from out my breast, streaming wildly o'er each other. No embarrassment it gave me to relate them, for the knowing that the person we confide to a like weakness must acknowledge gives us twere to our confusion a sweet soothing and a solace. For at times a bad example has its use. In fine, my sorrows she with pity heard, relating even her own grief to console me. When he has himself been guilty with what ease the judge condoneth, Knowing from her own experience that twas idle to slow moving leisure to swift fleeting time to entrust one's injured honor, she could not advise me better as the cure of my misfortunes than to follow and compel him by prodigious acts of boldness to repay my honor's debt, and that such attempt might cost me less my fortune wished that I should a man's strange dress put on me. She took down an ancient sword, which is this I bear. The moment now draws nigh, I must unsheath it, since to her I gave that promise when confining in its marks. Depart to Poland, and so manage that the steel shall be seen by the chief nobles of that land, for I have hope that there may be one among them who may prove to thee a friend, an advisor and consoler. Well, in Poland I arrived. It is useless to inform thee what thou knowest already, how a wild steed resistless bore me to thy cavern tower, wherein thou with wonder didst behold me. Let us Past too, how Clitol passionately my cause supported, how he asked my life of the king who to him that boon accorded. How oh, discovering who I am, he presented me my proper dress to assume, an honest Straya to attend as maid of honor, so to thwart Astolfo's love and prevent the marriage contract. Let us too pass by that here thou didst once again behold me in a woman's dress, my form waking thus a twofold wonder, and approach the time, Clotaldo being convinced it was important that should wed and reign together, fair Estrella and Astolfo, gainst my honor, me advised to forego my right. But, oh, valiant Sigismund. Seeing that the moment cometh from thy vengeance, since heaven wishes thee today to burst the portals of thy narrow rustic cell, where so long immured thy body was the feeling of wild beast, was the sufferance what the rock is, and that gainst thy sire and country thou hast gallantly revolted, and tain arms I come to assist thee intermingling the bright corselet of Minerva with the trappings of Diana, thus enrobing silken stuff and shining steel in a rare but rich adornment. On then, on, undaunted champion, to us important to prevent and bring to naught this engagement in betrothal. First to me, that he, my husband, should not falsely wed another. Then to thee, that their two staffs being united, their jointed forces should with overwhelming power leave our doubtful victory hopeless. Woman, I come here to urge thee to repair my injured honor. And as man, I come to rouse the crown and scepter to recover. Woman, I would wake thy pity since here at thy feet I throw me. 
and as man, my sword and person in thy service, I devote to thee. But remember, if today as a woman thou shouldst court me, I as man will give thee death. Double upholding of my honor, since I am in this strife of love, this contents, woman my complaints to tell thee, and a man to guard my honor. Heavens, if it is true I dream, memory then suspend thy office, for it is vain to hope remembrance could retain so many objects. Help me, God. Teach or teach me how all these numerous doubts to conquer, or to cease to think of any. Who ever tried such painful problems? If twas but a dream, my grandeur, how then is it at this moment that this woman can refer to me to some facts that are notorious? Centrist truth and not a dream. But if it was truth, another and no less confusion. How can my life be called in proper speech to dream? So like to dreams are then all the world's chief glories, that the true are oft rejected as the false, the false too often are mistaken for true. Is there twixt one and the other such slight difference that a question may arise at any moment, which is true or which is false? Are the original and the copy so alike that which is which of the doubtful mind must ponder? <sighs> if tis so, and if tis vanish as the shades of night and morning, all of majesty and power, all of grandeur and of glory, let us learn at least to turn to our prophet the brief moment that is given us, since our joy lasteth while our dream lasts only. In my power, Rosara stands. Thou, my heart, her charms adoreth. Let us then seize the occasion. Let love trample in its boldness all the laws on which relying she here at her feet, her at my feet, has thrown her. Tis a dream, and since tis so, let us dream of joys. The sorrows will come soon enough hereafter. <sighs> but with mine own words just spoken, let me now confute myself. If it is a dream that mocks me, who for human vanities would forgo celestial glory? What past bliss is not a dream? Who has had his happy fortunes so who had not said to himself, as his memory ran o'er him, all I saw beyond a doubt was a dream? If this exposes my delusion, if I know that desire is but the glowing of a flame that turns to ashes at the softest wind that bloweth, let us then seek the eternal, the true fame that ne'er reposes, where the bliss is not a dream, nor the crown of fleeting glory. Without honor is Rosara, but it is a prince's province to give honor, not to take it. Then, by heaven, it is her honour that for her I must win back, ere this kingdom I can conquer. Let us fly, then, this temptation. Tis too strong. To arms! March onward! For today I must give battle, ere descending night, the golden sunbeams of expiring day buries in the dark green ocean. Dost thou thus, my lord, withdraw thee? What? Without a word being spoken, does my pain deserve no pity? Does my grief so little move thee? Can it be, my lord, thou wilt not deign to hear, to look upon me? Dost thou even avert thy face? Ah, oh, Rosara, tis thy honour that requires this harshness now. If my pity I would show me. Yes, my voice does not respond, tis my humour that respondeth. True, I speak not, for I wish that my actions should speak for me. Thee I do not look on, no, for alas, it is of moment, 
that he must not see thy beauty who is pledged to see thy honor. What enigmas, O oh ye skies, after many a sigh and tear, thus in doubt to leave me here with the equivocal replies. Madam, is it visiting hour? Welcome, Claren. Where have you been? Only four stout walls between in an old enchanted tower. Death was on the cards for me. But amid the sudden strife, ere the last trump came, my life won the trick and I got free. I ne'er hoped to sound again. Why? Because alone I know who you are, and this being so, learn. Clotaldo is... The strain puts me out. What can it be? From the citadel at hand, leaguered round an armed band, as to certain victory sallies forth with flags unfurled. Against Prince Sigamund, and I, coward that I am, not by to surprise in all the world, when with so much cruelty each on each the two hosts spring. Long live our victor king! Long live our liberty! Live! Long live the two, I say. Me, it matters not a pin which doth lose or which doth, which doth win, if I can keep out of the way. So aside here I will go, acting like a prudent hero, even as the Emperor Nero took things coolly long ago. Or if care I cannot shun, let it bout mine own self be. Yes, here hidden I can see all the fighting and the fun. What a cozy place I spy mid the rock there, so secure. Death can't find me out, I'm sure. Then a fig for death, I say. Hapless king, disastrous rage, outraged father, guilty son. See, thy vanquished forces run in a panic o'er the plain. And the rebel conquerors stay proud, defiant. Tis decreed. Those are loyal who succeed. Rebels, those who lose the day, let us then Clotildo flee. Since a victory he hath won from a proud and cruel son. Heaven protect me. Who can be this last victim of the fight who is struck down in the retreat falls here bleeding at our feet? I am an unlucky white who to shun death's fearful face found the thing I would forget, flying from him, him I've met. For there is no secret place hid from death, and therefore I this conclusion hold as dear. He escapes best who goes more near, he dies first who first doth fly. Then return, return and be in the bloody conflict lost where the battle rages most. There is more security than in hills how desolate since no safety can there be against the force of destiny and the inclemency of fate. Therefore, tis in vain thou fliest from the death thou drawst more nigh. Oh, take heed, for thou must die, if it is God's will thou diest. Oh, take heed, for thou must die, if it is God's will thou diest. With what eloquence, O oh heaven, does this body that here lieth through the red mouth of a womb to profoundest thoughts entice us from our ignorance and our error? The red current as it glideth in a bloody tongue that teaches all man's diligence is idle when against a greater power and a higher cause it striveth. Thus with me, in strife and murder, when I thought I had provided, I but brought upon my country all the ills I would have hindered. Oh, my lord, fate knoweth well every path and quickly findeth whom it seeks. But still it strikes me, it is not Christian-like to say against its rage that naught suffices. That is wrong. A prudent man, even o'er fate victorious rises. 
Thou art not preserved from the ills that have surprised thee. From worse ills thyself preserve. Sire, Clotilda doth address thee as a cautious, prudent man, whose experience time hath ripened. I, as a bold youth would speak, yonder having lost its rider, I behold a noble steed wandering reinless and unbridled. Mount and fly with him while I guard the open path behind thee. If it is God's will I die, or if death for me here lieth, as in ambush face to face, I will meet it and defy it. Mid the thickest of the mountain, neath these dark boughs so united, the king hides. Pursue him then, leave no single shrub unrifled. Nothing must escape your search, not a plant and not a pine tree. Fly, my lord! And wherefore fly? Come! Astolfo, I am decided. To do? To try. Clotaldo, one sole remedy that surviveth. If it is me thou art seeking, prince, at thy feet behold me lying. Let thy carpet be these hairs, which the snows of age have whitened, and tread upon my neck and trample on my crown in base defilement. Treat me with all disrespect. Let thy deadliest vengeance strike me through my honor as thy slave. Make me serve thee, and in spite of all precautions, let fate be. Let heaven keep the word it plighted. Princes of the court of Poland, who such numerous surprises have astonished seen, attend, for it is your prince invites you. That which heaven has once determined, that which God's eternal finger has upon the azure tablets of the sky sublimely written, those transparent sheets of sapphire superscribed with golden ciphers, ne'er deceive and never lie. The deceiver and the liar is he to, to use them badly, in a wrongful sense defines them. Thus, my father, who is present to protect him from the wildness of my nature, made of me a fierce brute, a human wild beast, so that I, who from my birth, from the noble blood that trickles through my veins, my generous nature and my liberal condition, might have proved a docile child. And so grew, it was sufficient, by so strange an education and so wild a course of living, to have made my manners wild. What a method to refine them. If to any man was said, it is fated that some wild beast will destroy you, would it be wise to wake a sleeping tiger as the remedy of the ill? If it was said, the sword here is hidden in its sheath, which thou dost wear is the one for doomed to kill thee. Vain precaution it would be to preserve the threatened victim, bear to point it at his breast. If to said, these waves that ripple calmly here for thee will build foam white sepulchres of silver. Wrong it were to trust the sea when its haughty breast is lifted into mountain heights of snow, into curling hills of crystal. Well, this very thing has happened unto him who feared a wild beast and awoke him while he slept, or who drew a sharp sword hidden naked forth, or dared the sea when it was roused by raging whirlwinds. And though my fierce nature, hear me, as was as for the sleeping tiger, a she that soared my innate rage and my wrath a quiet ripple, fate should not be forced by means so unjust and so vindictive, for they but excite it more. And thus he, who would be victor of his fortune, must succeed by wise prudence and self-strictness. Not before an evil cometh can it rightly be resisted, e'en by him who hath foreseen it. For although the facts admitted, by a humble resignation it is possible to diminish its effects, it first must happen, and by no means can be hindered. Let it serve as an example, this strange sight, this most surprising spectacle, this fear, this horror, 
this great prodigy, for none higher where was work to than this we see. After years of vain contriving, prostrate at my feet a father and a mighty king submitted. This the sentence of high heaven, which he did his best to hinder, he could not prevent. Can I, who in valor and in science, who in years am so inferior, it avert? My lord, forgive me. Rise, sir, let me clasp thy hand. For since heaven has now apprised thee that thy mode of counteracting its decree was wrong, a willing sacrifice to thy revenge, let my prostrate neck be given. Son, this noble act of mine in my heart of hearts reviveth all my love. Thou art there reborn. Thou art prince. The bay that binded, bindeth heroes' brows, the palm be thine. Let the crown thine own deeds give thee. Oh, oh, we have Sigismund. Sigismund, our king. So my sword must wait a little, ere great victories it can gain. I today will win the highest, the most glorious, or myself. Give, Astolfo. Give your plighted hand here to Rosara, since it is due and I require it. Though tis true, I owe the debt. Still, tis needful to consider that she knows not who she is. It were infamous a stigma on my name to wed a woman. Stay, Astolfo. Do not finish. Rosara is as noble as herself. My sword will write her in the field against the world. She's my daughter sufficient. What do you say? Until I saw her to a noble spouse united, I her birth would not reveal. It were now a long recital, but the sum is she is my child. That being so, the word I have plighted, I will keep. And that Astraea must have may not now be left afflicted, seeing she has lost a prince of such valor and distinction, I proposed from mine own hand, as a husband one to give her, who, if he does not exceed him in worth, perhaps may rival. Give to me thy hand. I gain by an honor so distinguished. To Clotaldo, who so truly served my father, I can give him. But these open arms, wherein he will find whate'er he wishes. Thou honorest those who serve thee. Thus to me, the first beginner of the tumult through the land, who from at the tower thy prison drew thee forth, what wilt thou give? Just that tower. And that you issue never from it until death. I will have you guarded strictly. For the traitor is not needed once the treason is committed. So much wisdom makes one wonder. What a change in his condition. How discreet, how calm, how prudent. Why this wonder, these surprises, if my teacher was a dream? And amid my new aspirings, I am fearful I may wake, and once more a prisoner find me in my cell. But should I not? Even to dream it is sufficient. For thus have I come to know that at last all human blisses pass and vanish as a dream. Mm. And the time that may be given me, I would henceforth turn to gain, asking for our heart's forgiveness, since to generous noble hearts it is natural to forgive them. End of play. Thank you for joining us for Life is a Dream. Uh, thank you also to our friend, your friendly neighborhood Shakespeare for hosting this, this on his pages. Uh, check out those pages. His website is shakespeareproofs.com. His Patreon is patreon.com slash Shakespeare. His Facebook page is simply Shakespeare Approves, your friendly neighborhood Shakespeare. Uh, a massive thanks to all of the actors who read for us this evening. If you would like to see more of them and over a hundred other readers, head to our Facebook page. If you're not already watching there, that's Zenith Players. And all of our past readings can be found there. They're also a little better organized on our website, zenithplayers.com. 
uh, on that same website, I highly encourage you to check out our highly attractive donations page. Um, thank you all for joining us. We'll be back very soon with a holiday reading uh, on December 18th. We're just finalizing that now. And um, thank you and good night.